Well, Malia, thank you for sharing your story with us, and kia ora, everyone. I don't know what comes to your mind or what you feel when you hear the word church, but my hunch is it's a far cry from what the people in the first century thought of, of that initial gathering. So what comes to your mind when you think of church? Perhaps it's a building, or perhaps it's bands, or if you're an accountant, perhaps it's budgets. But the early church had none of these things that all start with the letter B, at least in the way we have them today. Instead so of the very, very beginning, the church began as this dynamic movement. And this movement was built around a really simple idea that Jesus was, in fact, who Jesus claimed to be, that Jesus had promised to renew all things, and that they had actually seen the resurrected Jesus and the empty tomb. And it was this event of his resurrection, and it was a testimony of eyewitnesses to that event that basically launched the church. Now, sadly, we know from history that any dynamic movement can easily become a, a frozen institution. Perhaps you've seen that kind of change before. And it happens when people get fixated on things like buildings and bands and budgets or, or, or programs, or personal preferences and, and traditions. And none of these things need to be wrong. But history shows us that when we place our primary focus on these things, we, we fail to experience church as this dynamic movement where everyone has a place to belong in this movement. Now, we have an underlying question that underpins our series on seismic shifts. How did the early church thrive, not just survive, but thrive amidst all the challenges that the church faced? How did it survive, for instance, like 70 AD when all of ancient Judaism came to this screeching halt, when, when the temple was torn down, the city invaded, and all the, all the Jews were thrown out of Jerusalem? Now, how did it survive the power of Rome and the power of, of the religious leaders of um, the Jews who sought to eradicate the church? And how did this largely uneducated people with such skimpy resources impact the wider culture of their day? See, I love the way Michael Green talks about this in his book, 30 Years That Changed the World. Right at the beginning of the book, he says, in the 30 years between AD 33 and 64, a new movement was born. In those 30 years, it got sufficient growth and credibility to become the largest religion the world has ever seen and to change the lives of hundreds of millions of people. It has spread into every corner of the globe and has more than 2 billion adherents. It has an indelible impact on civilization, on culture, on education, on medicine, on freedom, and of course, the lives of countless people worldwide. And it all began, he says, with a dozen men and a handful of women, and then the spirit came. See, so far in Acts, we've seen how the story began with this initial handful of people meeting in the upper room of a house and actually just tucked that location away because it's quite important in a moment. And with the message of the kingdom in their hands, so seismic shift number one, and the Spirit of God dwelling in their lives, so seismic shift number two, they poured into the streets of Jerusalem just, just a couple of months after the resurrection. And they declared that Jesus was crucified right outside these, these very walls, uh, that he rose again uh, just outside these city walls. And, and they were eyewitnesses of this event, of the Savior of the world. And this news turned Jerusalem on its head. And from the first day, 3,000 came to faith. And Luke tells us that number multiplied, remember seismic shift number three, to over 5,000 men within a couple of months. There were uh, 5,000 men plus women and children, all that embraced this idea that Jesus had died, he had risen, and that he was offering life and relationship and freedom in him. So what happened next? Well, I want you to notice right here at the end of Acts chapter 2. This is what Luke says happened, this, this dynamic movement. And I love the way Luke captures it right here at the end of Acts chapter 2. He says, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them, and all the apostles performed miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. Brad spoke about that in seismic shift number four this last week. Uh, verse 46, it says, They worshiped together at the temple each day, and they met in homes for the Lord's Supper, shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God 
and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who had been saved. Do you notice where they met? Uh, Luke says, initially they met in these temples until eventually they were kicked out. And they met in homes. And as you read through your Acts devotions over this next week, I, I want you to notice how, how much this idea of house or home comes up throughout the story of Acts. So Sir Luke will tell us about the way they, they met in the house of Jason or Justin or Philip or the way they met in a home to pray or for communion or for evangelism or for connection or fellowship. And it's all summed up really nicely in, in Acts 20 verse 20 where, where, where Luke tells us, you, you, uh, this is Paul speaking now, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you but have taught you publicly from house to house. See, though they were a mega church from day one with like 3,000 people coming to faith, they found ways to stay small. It's the idea of a big little church that we considered a couple of weeks ago. They were large, but they found a way to keep it personal and relational. And the way they did this was placing a high priority on the home as the central hub of this dynamic and attractive movement. And it's why when you read through the New Testament letters, you'll read comments about a church that meets in this home or a church that meets in this house. Because the home was the center of community life and mission. You see, many scholars point to this as one of the seismic shifts for the first initial great spread of the gospel. For instance, a Russian scholar and author, Johannes Rama, uh, writes this. He says, the private house, characterized by intense relationships among family and friends, it offered a platform for successful evangelization and allowed unprecedented growth of the church. And the church consciously used family networks as a key for its missionary work. He says evangelism and consequently church development were centered on family and friends. You see, the early church was this dynamic movement that spread from house to house to house. And it attracted people. People saw the difference Jesus had made in their lives, and they wanted in on that. So what do we do with all this? And what do we not do with this? I mean, does this mean we need to sell our church buildings and, and focus only on homes? And the answer is no. So we're going to see later in our series, the New Testament is incredibly flexible in the way we gather and the way we structure ourselves as a church, as long as mission is primary to us. But having said that, this, this should be a wake-up call for us. You see, through this pandemic, I've heard people say things like, you know, we can't be church anymore because we're not meeting at church, meaning the building where large gatherings take place. But the truth is, according to Acts, the early church didn't have any special buildings for like the first 300 years of its movement. And it faced huge cultural challenges, and yet it thrived. See, I love the way we're meeting in homes right now. And we'll continue even when we have in-person services beginning in two weeks' time. And having our services stream into homes all around the place through church online. You know, we're gathering, we're connecting, we're worshiping, we're, we're learning together. And many of you are connecting with Grace City at my place. You're doing so in homes. You're, you're meeting week by week with others in your neighborhood. In fact, uh, this past Sunday, we had a new group, uh, Grace City at my place, begin in Flaxmere down in Hawke's Bay. You know, shout out right now to Harataki and Shona, uh, who I had the joy of connecting with this past week. I love seeing the photo, uh, the smiles on their faces. See, while, while homes here in Acts were important then and now, I believe this is a seismic shift that we need to embody as we step into this new era. So we know this shift as hospitality. See, author Henry Nowen summed it up really well. If there is any concept worth restoring to its original depth and evocative potential, he says it's this concept of hospitality. And we saw this in our series uh, this past year called The Invitation, where we unpacked the theology of hospitality. You can uh, still find that on YouTube and go back to it. You see, hospitality, it really is the convergence of three ideas. It's this warm and welcoming whānau. It's this integrated way of, of life and faith where it all comes together. And it's an environment where everyone has a part to play. And in Grace City, we see these three traits as 
foundational. And so actually these reflect three of our four values. I want to unpack these a bit further this morning. So the first is Fano. As a church, we say, as Fano, we are authentic, loving, and generous. So did you know that there's a particular common phrase throughout the New Testament with, with just two words, one another? Can you guess how many times that phrase is used? Over 50 times. And each time there's a different verb that's just placed before it. It might be like pray for one another or, or care for one another or, or meet with one another. You see, none of these things can happen unless the community comes together where we can actually have one another time. And that's why these early believers are doing right here as we come to Acts chapter 2. We see them connecting with one another, breaking bread with one another, sharing, serving one another, praising God as a, as a community of people. This is one of the seismic shifts we're talking about. In their case, all this was taking place in homes around the city. And to understand why the home was so important in this growing movement, we need to look no further than the architecture of their homes. See, while we don't have VR goggles to send out to everyone today, here's a model of what the homes tended to look like to help us imagine things. What do you notice the way that the houses are really close together? You see the way that life took place was largely in this open space where, where everything you did was in pretty much full display to your neighbors. It's quite different today, isn't it, from our own homes where we tend to retreat. So the garage door goes up, we, we drive our car into the garage, garage door comes down and we retreat inside. Next day the garage door comes out and we, we leave and really nobody sees us until we go in and out with the car. So while kids used to play out on the streets, they've retreated to the backyards, and now for many kids, it's inside the house. Or to say that our family life now is largely behind closed doors. And really, this presents a challenge for the church. You see, for the early years, your neighbors of that time would hear many of your conversations, the way you honored one another, the, the way you would do conflict, uh, the way you were honest with one another, the way you raised your children, the, the way you looked after one another. And there was no way that you could hide your convictions or hide your faith or hide the distinctive way of life you had as a follower of Jesus. It all stood out. And it's this distinctive way of life that they saw that was attracted to these early people. They said, well, what, what's so different about your life? Why do you treat him or her that way? I heard about your conversation, they'd say. See, they heard a community of people who were doing these one another's, encouraging each other, praying for one another, serving one another, that they would hear the community singing and praising God because none of it was hidden away. So what happened? Well, people were attracted by the way the church came together as Fano. You see, author Rosia Butterfield, in her brilliant book, The Gospel Comes with a House Key, which I highly recommend, she says, the table turns strangers into neighbors and neighbors into family. That's what these people were doing. And as a result of doing this, the church grew as a movement. So let me ask you a couple of questions. First, to what extent are you vitally connected with others here at Grace City? You see, we all need a place where we can belong, where people know our names and they pray for us, they check in on us, and we do the same for them. You see, no one can connect for you uh, my role as pastor is, is really ensuring you have opportunities where you can connect and, and that you understand the importance of connecting. And so I want to encourage you, if you haven't already, take a next step towards this. In fact, here are four things coming up on the screen that you might want to think about. Uh, explore Grace City. It's a great next step if you're new or newish here. To attend a Grace City of my place, now happening throughout our city and, and even further afield. To join a connect group and to serve in a ministry team. And there's details about any of those opportunities up on our website. And they're all there because we want to help you find a place where you can belong. Of course, the second question is, well, what's one thing that you might do differently in your life right now in order to reach out to other people to be hospitable? Because this is where seismic shifts take place. So the first trait of this dynamic hospitable movement is whānau. The second trait is wholeness. 
that we seek the wholeness that Jesus brings through his word, his spirit, and community. You know, it's a common thing today to divide our lives into all these different segments. We have our, have our home life, we have our, our work life, our, 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 our leisure life, and our church life. Now, I don't know why it happens like this, but, but perhaps it's um, like a scheduling thing, or, or perhaps it's just what we've been grown up with, but it's really common, isn't it? And one of the reasons I think the early church was so attractive is that it integrated faith and life as a whole. You see, their identity as followers of Jesus affected everything, the way they related, the way they worked, the decisions they made in all areas of, of life. So you hone in on one of these houses of that time, and again, you, you look at some of the architecture, and you can begin to imagine what neighbors would, would see and hear around them. So upstairs, uh, right here, you can see that there are living court, uh, quarters with, um, without it really a lot of private space. And so when we read in Acts 2 that they're gathering in the home, they're effectively squeezing in, are singing and conversing in that space, and the neighbors are seeing and hearing a lot of what's happening. But also notice here the arches at the base of the home. Likely that's where you would raise your animals and, and, and where you would work. Uh, working from home was, was normal back then, as it's increasingly becoming so today. And this was your workshop. Uh, your neighbors would see the, the deals you were doing. They'd see the way you, you went about your job and see what you did and didn't do in work. So let me ask you, to what extent do your colleagues and your neighbors see the way your faith affects the way you live at home, at work, the way you go about leisure? You see, at Grace City, one of our values is wholeness. We say we, we seek to be whole people, clear in our identity and purpose, with no line between faith and life. Uh, we believe this transformation in our lives touches our homes, our hearts, our workplaces, our entire city. And we believe that we're to live differently as we listen to Jesus through his word, through his spirit, and with one another. See, wholeness is one of the traits of the early church. And it's one of those traits that led to this dynamic movement that people so wanted to be a part of. So we've seen Fano, we've seen wholeness as these recognizable traits of hospitality. There's one other, participation. That we're empowered to participate in God's renewal of our world. You see, when Jesus told his followers to be his witnesses, he had in mind everyone. Every one of these early believers owned the mission. They saw themselves as missionaries and church planters and people who were always pointing to others, to, to Jesus, to, to the good news that, that Jesus had in store for them. You know, a pastor friend of mine in, in Texas it leads to this wonderful church called Chase Oaks. And, and Robin and I uh, were privileged to, to be um, there and on, on, on the staff there for uh, three or four years in Dallas, Texas. And, and Jeff was telling me um, how he traveled um, across one time to, to Ethiopia to look at some global mission projects that uh, they were exploring at the time. And while there, he was talking to a hundred of the, the leaders in this Ethiopian church community, and he wanted to hear about their dreams and, and ways that Chase Oaks might be able to help them in, in partnership. And these leaders uh, were going through a really tough time. There was a lot of persecution in the area. And yet they shared with Jeff their dream to start new churches across Ethiopia where people could hear about Jesus. And so Jeff asked one of them, well, how many in your church of 100 people could you send out as missionaries and church planters to start new churches? And Jeff said that this leader kind of looked kind of puzzled and confused and said, well, 100. And Jeff said, no, no, I don't mean how many people are in your church I mean, how many in your church of 100 people could you send out as missionaries to spread the gospel and to begin your churches? And again, the Ethiopian leader looked confused and said, well, 100, every one of them. And it was like he was saying, well, isn't that how all Christians are meant to be? Isn't this the way it is from where you come from? And Jeff said he wanted to hide under a rock. You see, this Ethiopian leader understood that mission is for everybody, that God calls all of us to embark upon this. You see, everyone is involved in, in building relationship with, with people who don't know, don't know Jesus. This is the way it's meant to be. And, and it's going to look different for, for each one of us. 
But ultimately, every single one of us needs to actively be involved in, in talking about Jesus and spreading news about Jesus throughout the wider community. Now, you might not know Jesus at this point in your own life. And so we're actually here to help you in your journey because we want you to know Jesus in a very personal way. But we believe that this call infuses all of our lives with intention and passion. And we recognize that wherever we are, all of us can partake in this, this kingdom message, letting people know the transforming love of God. I wonder if you've seen the movie Madagascar. If you've got kids, I would imagine you've seen it uh, probably more than once. And the movie begins with a bunch of, of wild animals in a zoo. Now, all the spectators are, are in awe of these, these powerful and exotic animals. Of course, everyone's favorite is the, is the lion, right? The, the children go crazy cheering every time he roars. And, and most of the animals love the whole setup. They're, they're extremely well cared for. The trainers wait on them. They, they care for them. Uh, they, they bring them everything that uh, they need and ensure that their habitats, which are carefully designed to look like the wild, they're actually quite safe and comfortable for all of the animals, but one day the zebra finds himself dreaming about the wild. He can't shake that, the feeling that he wasn't made to live in a zoo. He was actually made to roam free. And his restlessness creates a, a situation where several of the animals actually escape the zoo and later find themselves stranded in the jungle of Madagascar. And the movie, it's, it's a hilarious movie, mostly stemming from watching these domesticated animals trying to survive in the wild. After all, these animals were born to live free, born with these instincts and, and physical characteristics required to thrive. But their zoo environment had, had made them tame, quite useless in the wild. You know, I wonder whether you've felt much like the zebra, that you've been a faithful member of our church, but you've, you've, you've got this feeling that you were created for so much more. Maybe you've heard others talk about the wild before, doing things out there for Jesus. But for you, it's never felt like the right time. And you said, he said, well, you know, I'll do it when you know, this settles down or my job settles down or the kids get older or the pandemic has passed. Or perhaps you've experienced it in, in the past. Perhaps you, you had an overseas mission trip or you got involved in, in serving in a ministry team or, or sharing the gospel of Jesus in, in your neighborhood. And you experienced the joy of following those instincts that we have as followers of Jesus, where you thrived. But now, now it's like you're stuck in the zoo. And where everything is comfortable, and everything is like programmed around you, somewhat controlled. But really deep down, you just have this instinct to actually live in the wild, the way that you were created to be. See, author Francis Chan uses that movie as an illustration in his book, Letters to the Church. And, and then he, he finishes up and he writes, Church, the answer is not to build bigger and nicer cages, nor is it to renovate the cages so they look more like the wild. It's time to open the cages and remind the animals of the God-given instincts and capabilities and release them into the wild. You know, we have this wonderful opportunity right now to open our lives, open our homes, to witness to this message of the kingdom and to follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit and to proactively respond to the needs of people around us. Now, you, you can't do everything, but what you sense by the Spirit of God saying to you today, I encourage you to step out, step into it, follow the leading of the Spirit and allow seismic shifts to take place in our city in this movement of the gospel. Now, I, I realize there's a whole lot of challenges we're all experiencing right now. But rather than feel hopeless and helpless, let's look again at the story of the early church. Because this community thrived even under persecution, even with limited resources, even at job loss, even when they had reduced incomes. And while the world finds security in all of these other things, the thing is our ultimate security, it comes from a relationship with Jesus where we know we are, we are loved regardless of what we're experiencing. And this changes the lens we have in life. You see, their homes and their lives became a place of whanau, of wholeness and of participation. 
and their homes were places where people could belong, thrive, and renew. And the reason they grew as a movement is summed up in seismic shift number five. Hospitality. That your home is a mission field where you can welcome others into God's ever-growing whānau to journey in authentic love. It's about each of us embodying this mission and allowing our lives and our homes to be places of whānau and wholeness and participation. Now, to help us take some next steps, we have some questions coming up here on the screen. They'll also be placed in the, in the chat spaces. I encourage you to reflect on these questions and then discuss them after the service with, with family or household or, or a Grace City of My Place group that you're part of today. So how do people in your world recognize that you're a follower of Jesus? Where have you appreciated or experienced hospitality? How might you connect further at Grace City and then together decide one thing you can do differently to show one person or family that hospitality. Because ultimately, radical hospitality comes from a heart of gratitude for what Jesus has done for us. And that's why as I pray today, I'm going to be taking communion. You're welcome to join me wherever you are today. And by doing this, I'm remembering, I'm reminding myself of what Jesus has done for me. The way he has brought me into Fano the way he uh, um, has a spirit guide me to experience wholeness and the way he invites me to be a participant in this great mission and calling of the gospel. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you that we get to dine with you and that this is a simple snack of bread and that this cup is just so small in and of itself It reminds us of the incredible way that you welcome us into your family. Thank you, Jesus, for your hospitality, for the way you bring me, the way you bring all of us into Fano, the way you transform us with wholeness, and the way you invite us into the work that you're doing to renew people and places everywhere. Thank you, Jesus, for this bread and this cup. We take it. And we remember you. Amen.